this session specifically focuses on uh, this question of presidential politics and national policy. Um, it's titled White House Black Journalists. And of course, there is always um, a deep irony to uh, Black journalists covering presidential politics um, because of the fact that the White House itself uh, was built by enslaved Black people. Um, and in, I think, the last few years uh, it, during the Trump administration, we've seen increasing antagonism um, towards Black journalists but towards journalism in general um, and towards the, the folks who are trying to cover issues related to politics and policy. And so I'm really excited today to have three wonderful panelists for this session. We are going to talk about uh, the importance of political coverage by Black journalists. And we're gonna think through maybe some of the challenges and possibilities that both the Trump and Obama administrations posed. And hopefully we'll get to as many of your questions as we can. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First, we have Aisha Roscoe. She's a White House reporter for NPR. In her current role, she covers breaking news and policy developments from the White House. Roscoe also travels and reports on many of President Trump's foreign trips, including his 2019 summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Hanoi, Vietnam, and his 2018 summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Helsinki, Finland. As part of the White House team, she's also a regular on NPR Politics Podcast, which is where I hear her all the time. Uh, great to have you, Aisha. Next, we have Beatrice Peterson, who joined ABC News as a producer and reporter in October 2018. She's a graduate of Trinity Washington University in Washington, DC, and Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, where she was a Joseph Pulitzer and Edith Pulitzer Moore Fellow. Before joining ABC News, Beatrice previously worked for Politico and France to Televisions, I am guessing is the French pronunciation. Please forgive me, native French speakers. And last but not least, um, we have Jelani Cobb. He's been a, contribu a contributor to The New Yorker since 2012 and became a staff writer in 2015. He writes frequently about race, politics, history, and culture. His most recent book is The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress. He won the 2015 Sidney Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis Journalism for his columns on race, the police and justice. And he teaches at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. I am so, first off, I'm so happy to see you all. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, I'm also really excited for this conversation because I'm not sure there has been ever been a more sort of both rife and um, open for potential <laughs> moment in um, political coverage and political journalism, particularly for folks um, who are historically represent, uh, underrepresented um, in the area. So I wanted to start out with a question to help us sort of get to know uh, you all. Um, if you could share a bit about how you became uh, somebody that covers uh, politics and policy, um, how did you end up here and why did you choose politics and policy to tell stories about and what do you hope you contribute to these kinds of stories? And Aisha, would you like to go first? Yeah, yeah, I can go first. Um, you know, I kind of, I ended up in covering politics because, really because I went to Howard University. I, you know, I have to drop that, but I went to Howard. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, could you, could you say that again? I went to Howard University, the oh, yeah, right. Um <laughs> And so, you know, I was in DC and I really, I just wanted a job. I wanted to be paid to be a journalist. Uh, and that was really my goal. I didn't really know exactly where I would end up. I actually ended up at Reuters, which is a newswire like the AP. Uh, and I was covering business, you know, cause they're, I mean, they primarily make their bread and butter from like, uh, you know, traders and things like that. So I was covering energy and commodities, but because I was in DC and ended up getting a job in DC, I was covering policy. Um, and so I ended up, that's how I ended up covering Congress and ended up, you know, covering federal agencies and, you know, covering some stuff that happened at the White House uh, because, you know, there, there's that intersection there. And so even though I was covering energy for many years, I think about seven years of my reporting experience was covering energy, I was still covering policy. I was covering the reaction to the BP oil spill. I was covering, you know, the, the fallout from uh, the Fukushima meltdown in Japan and how that affected uh, the U.S., 
uh, and what was happening over here and what was happening in Congress and trying to open up oil drilling all over the, the country and all offshore. Uh, and so that's how I got into it. And, and that's what I've always liked about policy is that you can definitely see where it intersects with real people and the, the real life impacts of it. And so that's how I got into it. And then eventually I started helping out at reporting at the White House and then I started covering the White House. So, and I've been doing that ever since. Great, thank you. Jelani, you wanna go next? Oh, sure. Um, so I think to you know, continue with Aisha's point, you know, I started out at Howard University. Oh. And, um, you know, the Mecca. <laughs> and, you know, I had been interested in politics, you know, from, you know, a really early point. Uh, and it was on the opposite side, you know, being a student activist, you know, at Howard and being involved in, you know, the people who were outside the corridors of power. Interestingly enough, you know, two of my classmates, you know, from, you know, who are political scientists, science majors, you know, went on to be, you know, heads of cities, you know, so current mayor of Newark, Raz Baraka, and the uh, former mayor of Atlanta, Kasim Reed, you know, who were you know classmates and people who came in with me uh, around then, and we were all interested in understanding how the issues we were concerned about got translated into policy and power, and like who was making the decisions that culminated in things that resulted in us out in the street, you know, uh, protesting, and that required that we get a more nuanced understanding of how power actually was administered and distributed. And being, uh, and also to echo Aisha's point, being in DC was very significant. You know, you can go down to the Library of Congress, you can go down to Congress, you can go down to the Supreme Court. Uh, and, you know, I think that was the genesis of it. Uh, and I took, I think, a little bit of an atypical route in that, you know, I have a, a doctorate in American history. And so I've been, a person who had has had a foot in both of these worlds and i've been very much interested endlessly fascinated in fact by the relationship between the news that breaks at any given hour of the day and the history that preceded it and you know i think for the way that my brain works i can't understand the world any other way you know i instinctively kind of look at the antecedents for whatever it is that we're talking about now uh, when, and so I'd written about politics, you know, in various kind of capacities uh, before I came to the New Yorker. Uh, and then when I got to the New Yorker, the first thing that I ever wrote there uh, was, which was at that, that point about this news blip out of Florida in which there'd been a 17 year old boy shot and no arrests made. And then people didn't, it, it was kind of talked about on social media, but it wasn't, wasn't getting much coverage. Uh, and I wrote this thing called Trayvon Martin and the Parameters of Progress, the Parameters of Hope, rather. Uh, and it was uh, about having a Black president and having a 17-year-old still be killed and the same sort of institutional responses that we'd seen under all the preceding white presidencies. And from there, I kind of branched. That set the tone for the things that I was working on at The New Yorker. I didn't know that, that Trayvon would be followed by Ferguson uh, that he'd be followed by Jordan Davis, uh, Rakia Boyd, Renisha McBride, all the, the whole list, litany of names that we know, um, you know, Tamir Rice and so on. And in covering those stories, I was interested in connecting them to the policy, specifically around criminal justice, you know, which had been something I had been looking at and interested in as a historian. So I really was doing the work of, you know, connecting my history syllabus to the work that was happening, to what was happening in the streets. Thank you. Thank you. Beatrice. Well, I did not go to Howard, but my dad uh, did go to Howard. So I do have a little- Close enough. <laughs> He's in the neighborhood. Um, I grew up actually 15 minutes from the Capitol. I um, was born in Washington, DC. Um, politics were always kind of in the background for me. It wasn't necessarily something I thought I was going to do. Um, I had done music and my family's very musical. So I been in bands and had sung solos and I'd gotten a scholarship uh, to go to college to study music. And so that's what I thought I was going to do. Um, I went to Trinity uh, University um, and uh, Speaker Pelosi is a graduate and just in the air at 
at that university is politics. Everywhere you go is politics. And, you know, I took one class and a few teachers had maybe said, well, maybe you should think about looking into this club or looking into um, this organization. So I ended up taking a bunch of internships. I ended up working on Capitol Hill for a little bit for about a year, um, learning how politics really worked and how it really could make a difference in people's lives. And I just kind of fell into it. It wasn't something I expected. Um, however, uh, I ended up getting what many young interns think is the dream internship. I got an internship at the White House um, and they offered me a job at the end of the internship. And I realized, you know, that's not exactly what I want to do. I want to ask questions of these people. I want to hold them accountable. I want to say, well, why are you spending money on this? You know, and that's not something you can really ask as a staffer. You know, you, you can present people and present ideas, but you can't really ask those critical questions. Because imagine going to your boss and saying, why are you doing this like this? You know, it, it doesn't really work like that. Um, and so after I graduated from college, um, I had a few obligations um, and I, at the, I, I was at the DNC and I said, you know, I'm just going to go up to anyone I can find and ask, you know, are you hiring? Do you need an intern? Do you need a PA? Do you need someone um, to, to just get coffee orders. Um, I, I did not study journalism in school. I studied uh, politics and business, um, but I ended up just getting a job and, you know, one job became another job. And my first job was the French uh, television network covering the 2020, uh, 2012 re-election, which uh, for, for me, I knew what I was looking at politically because I had done campaign politics, but I didn't know what reporting was. So I ended up going back to J school at Columbia um, and learning more about trying to be a journalist. But because of that background, the way that I look at politics um, as a campaign reporter is really, you know, on the inside. I'm looking for different changes that are happening, why people are picking these people, why, um, you know, different policies are being rolled out versus other policies. And, you know, I think for me, at least personally, that really helped tell stories of, you know, people who are, you know, living day to day who may not have um, access to internet or may not have access to food or income inequality. So I take that to my reporting and it really shapes how I look at politics. Thank you so much. That's great. The, the Howard University connections, I have none. So I ruin the otherwise trifecta. I'm sorry. You're, well, um, you're friends with a Howard person. So. Yes, yeah, I'm friends with many Howard people. Yes, that's true. Um, well, great. So I want to jump right into like the thick of it here. So it's been quite a few years in terms of pre presidential politics, campaign politics, policy. And I'm wondering if you can each share or reflect on um, the biggest challenges and biggest opportunities you saw in covering politics and policy during the Trump administration. <laughs> Any order you want. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I can, I can jump in. I, I will say, uh, starting with the challenges, because that is front and center. Uh, the challenge, there are many of the, the Trump administration, but I, the, the biggest thing is the, the personal attacks on journalists. Uh, that, that has been challenging, uh, being a Black woman covering the White House at this point, and we've seen so many uh, Black women journalists uh, just disrespected, uh, you know, from Yamiche Alcindor of PBS NewsHour, uh, April Ryan of American Urban Radio Networks, um, Abby Phillips of CNN. Um, and, and so we've seen this, uh, Kristen Welker of NBC. So we've seen this over and over again. And there was a point after the midterms um, where he went after uh, April and Yamish and Abby, like in quick succession. And I remember going, I was going on a trip with him to Paris. And I think I got to Paris early, but it was as all of this was happening. And I remember just feeling like it, he's going down the line. Like it's only so many of us, you know, like mm -hmm. what, <laughs> what is coming next? Like, it's not, it's not that many of us. So it just seemed like, and it was so personal and it was so nasty and um, how and trying to operate in that space um, of, you know, seeing those types of attacks. I think that's been one of the biggest challenges. 
the challenge for all journalists has just been the truth and trying to, how do you tell, make sure that you're telling the truth um, and that you're not just echoing things that are not true. Uh, and how do you make sure that you are, you know, standing on firm ground uh, when you have a, an administration in a White House that is spinning really whole other realities. And we see that now. Um, and, and I think that the, the industry as a whole had to, and I, I'm not saying that there isn't a lot more work to do, but I think that there was a journey that the industry had to go on to be able to call things uh, out for what they are. Um, and because we were not dealing with just general, you know, politician, you know, sugar coating of a situation, like we're dealing with just outright um, things that are not true. And so I think that's been the biggest thing. There have been obviously opportunities, you know, I mean, any, everyone can look around and see that there have been opportunities. I got opportunities to get on TV because they were showing all of the briefings <laughs> live. And so that's how people saw me questioning, um, you know, saw me questioning Sarah Sanders and Sean Spicer. Um, and so there have been opportunities to tell stories. I also think there have been opportunities to have more honest conversations about race and, and things of that nature. They need to be more honest. Um, but I think that there has been an opening to have some of those conversations that in the past, I think have been more shut off. Mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of the difficulty has been, I mean, there's just layers of difficulty. One of the things that was most difficult was keeping hold of a storyline because we have never seen anything like this. That, you know, an outrageous thing that would normally be a two week story, you know, by the time you're done, there's four other stories. You know, four other things have happened and it kind of, you know, it becomes a test of your ability to remain uh, focused on one thing. You know, even as you know that this thing that you're doing will be outdated by the time it hits a website. You know, much less print. You know, it's like print is just for archival purposes. You know, if you're putting something up, it's already changed. And um, I think that presented, it's like the, the cliche about trying to drink from a fire hydrant. You know, there's too much too fast. And uh, there's that. The other difficulty I think was institutional and you know, if you would follow Jay Rosen or um, Soledad O'Brien, you know, uh, Margaret Sullivan, a couple other people, you know, who've been very outspoken about this, you know, but the media institutions fundamentally are not made to respond to someone like Donald Trump. And, you know, the example I gave, I was talking to my students and uh, I said, you know, raise your hand if you played a sport in high school or college, and about three quarters of them raised their hands. And I said, you know, keep your hand up if you played volleyball, softball, baseball, or even boxing. And uh, you know, the students who you know, had their hands up, I said, describe to me the first time you faced a left-hander. And they were like, oh my God, it was so difficult. Everything was backward. They were doing everything the opposite of what you expect. And like all of your training up to that point has been useless because you've been training against people who do things in the conventional way. And when you compete against a left-hander, they do things the exact opposite. So you have to relearn. And that's the position that the media was in, that the administration was like facing a left-hander and they never quite got around to understanding that their fundamental presumptions did them a disservice. And so there was a stunning willingness to presume that people were acting in good faith, even after Sarah Huckabee Sanders said under oath that she felt no obligation to tell the, the truth to the press. If that's, if, that, if that's the case, you should never have, there's no real basis for having you know, press conferences, pressers. You know, the, the point that when the administration made people shut off their cameras, they wouldn't let them uh, record and broadcast. And the fact that people actually did it it's like you show up, you turn on your camera, they kick you out. You show up the next day, you come back, you turn on your camera, they kick you out. Like we have colleagues who are reporting in Syria. And it's like, and you don't want to piss this dude off? It was breathtaking to see, like the level of institutional cowardice. 
you know, of people who had, uh, like really didn't have the temerity to anger the administration. Uh, you know, another person who I talked to, who's a host of a very well-regarded show who said to me, uh, you know, I think that a lot of this Trump stuff is just, you know, Democrats hyperventilating. And I was like, do you not understand the role of media in democracy? And fundamentally what's happening here is not partisan. Like firing inspector generals who are there to prevent corruption, that is nonpartisan. Getting rid of inspector generals is in order is a, a mechanism, a move that you make in order to facilitate corruption. And so it has been, you know, I think a test that that institutionally media has by and large failed. And I think having to have those conversations, I was fortunate in that the publication where I am, The New Yorker, as the people have been very clear, we did um, a, a special section called Trump and the Truth back in 2016, you know, talking about his voluminous mendacity, but by and large, people have been very slow on the uptake as it relates to like the challenges of, of reporting in an administration that is uh, it pursuing an authoritarian agenda. And, you know, I, I agree with the 24 hour news cycle aspect. I mean, every day, you know, you're getting a new tweet during this campaign, uh, this, this election cycle. And it's, it's kind of different. Um, I, I've, I covered the early part of the Trump presidency, at least. Um, and I um, actually, we found a tape that was uh, Andy Putzer, who was the labor uh, nominee early on. And we had gotten a VHS tape, we played it out and put it online. And, and it was very interesting because uh, this man who was a nominee by Trump, uh, let, wife went on Oprah Winfrey show in the, I guess, late, early 90s, late 80s, mm -hmm. and had alleged that her husband had abused her. And th the tape was circular, circulating around Capitol Hill, it was circulating around Washington. Um, and we actually had to go to a storage warehouse to get the tape because someone just happened to have it in their basement. And it was a story for a day or two, the nominee dropped out. And probably three days later, there was another story. And then there was another story. And then there was another story. And I think a lot of times, something like abuse, allegations that were suppressed, that would have been a new story for weeks, maybe one, two. Now this was hours, you know, and that made it a lot different. And one thing I noticed, um, I talked to a lot of politicians on Capitol Hill, and they, I think, I think this is something that a lot of people maybe missed. They were trying to figure out how to react to this new cycle because I would be in an interview and maybe there'll be a tweet that come out maybe five minutes earlier. And I say, well, do you have a reaction to this? And they say, what are you talking about? I'm like, check your Twitter. And they're like, oh my God. And, and that was on both sides. I think a lot of people had to adjust to that. And that was a very big challenge. Um, just the amount of news that came out every hour on the hour. I used to host at Politico, um, a show called Today in Trump World. Um, I would write my script roughly around 3 p.m., voiceover, track it, start editing it. And before I could even hit send, there was a tweet, there was a resignation, there was a completely different angle. And so I would have to on the fly, just completely throw out my script and just you know do it live. And I think that was something that I think a lot of people had to adjust to, um, but also, you know, traditionally the time between Thanksgiving and New Year's is usually pretty quiet in Washington. It's always been that way. People go home. Uh, now that's not the case. You're having Congress have to come back into session. You're having the White House be just as active as it would be in the summer, you know, the August summer recess isn't what it used to be. It's not really a recess. And I think that was a challenge for a lot of people in Washington to understand how to get a hold of this shift where it's not that you're just working nine to five Monday through Friday, you're working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every day. And there's something new always happening. And I think that really, uh, I think changed the landscape of both Washington and, and also politics as well as the media, because you're having to do these updating, breaking news. You're having to have the overnight team and not just one or two people on the overnights. You're having a whole team of overnight people who have to be able to react because there's a tweet that comes out at two o'clock in the morning and it's, it shapes policy. Um, it lets you know what's going to happen the day before, you know, you can't just go by off the, uh, the white house uh, daily guidance because that could change in a tweet. And that's just what it was. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And so I think one question I would like to ask is comparatively in terms of the, the challenges and the opportunities in terms of covering politics and policy and campaigns, did you all see a big difference, particularly for Black journalists, between um, the opportunities or maybe the challenges that existed during the Obama presidency and the Trump presidency? So can I say something? So at first, I think that Obama brought with him a tide of Black journalists um, because there's a whole kind of group of people who came into you know, significant publications during the Obama administration. And I think that you know, some of those publications were looking at you know, their staff and realizing that more Black people lived in the White House than worked for their publication. And so you know, there was a kind of shaming factor that happened. And a whole bunch of people kind of emerged there um, and also, I think publications were trying to understand and outlets, media outlets in general, were trying to understand what was happening, what Obama's significance was to race and America and, and, and so on. And in, in 2016, there began to be like this narrative in which almost it was like fashion. You're like, oh, you know, black is out, class is in, you know, and there became this narrative around you know, the overlooked working class white person. Uh, and it, it, people didn't necessarily want to hear what black journalists were saying, but I know personally, you know, myself, Tana Hasti, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Jamel Bowie, a ton of folk were in 2016 writing about like, yeah, this ain't economic anxiety. And being ignored and being said that, you know, you, if you all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, like you think everything is race. And it took a while before political scientists were actually coming back going, mm, nope, this is the biggest driving determinant of support for Trump is how people view immigrants uh, and how they view uh, questions of race. And so it was a matter of Trump's racial populism, not his economic populism that was was driving that phenomena that we saw emerge in that time. But it was like shouting into the wind. And even to a certain extent, that's still been the case. It, it changed somewhat after Charlottesville and, you know, you know, shithole countries and, uh, you know, the very kind of list of things that we could, we could look at, you know, connecting the overt uh, expressions of white supremacy uh, until it became untenable to, to defend Trumpism as anything but what it was. But I think there was a, dis a real, kind of distinct moment where people had just decided they'd heard what they wanted as much as they wanted to hear. And the black stuff was, you know, whatever. And now we want to talk about opioids in Ohio and white people who are out of work. Hmm. And I agree with that. I think um, there was kind of a lack of conversation about race. I think it was easy not to have that conversation because you had an African-American president. And, you know, I think a lot of the narratives you know, kind of overlooked a lot of these conversations that people, Black people were having in their communities and things that they were seeing. Um, you know, Trayvon Martin wasn't just, it didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't just happen and go away. You know, there were just little things that just kept happening. And, and at least for me, um, you know, I, I remember when Mike Brown was shot. I was mm -hmm. uh, at Politico at the time and I had said to people, I said, this is a big thing. Like I'm getting calls from folks in St. Louis and I don't, I don't know very many people in St. Louis, but people are finding my phone number and saying, hey, you guys need to cover this. You guys need to look at this. And there was a hesitancy, I think, with a lot of outlets to send people to, you know, to look at this, look at what's going on in Ferguson. And, you know, I do think that a, a lot of people kind of overlooked Ferguson and said, well, you know, as a black president, we'll just, you know, turn the page. But, you know, here you have a number of people who have been shot recently, George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, you have all these different names, and the issues never really changed. And, you know, there was, I think, a little bit of a hesitancy, at least when the protests happened, because I covered the protest, um, as to why people were protesting. And it was because we didn't cover these issues. These issues had largely been ignored for a number of years. And, you know, 
I think it, I think race is a factor that maybe was overlooked and I, not even maybe like overlooked. It was overlooked in, in 20, the end of 2012, but also um, 2016 and to lesser extent, somewhat early part of 2020. I think a lot of people just didn't know how to handle it and maybe didn't know what to look for uh, because white people were telling me, I, I had a white person in Tulsa tell me recently um, that they voted for Obama, but they had hesitancies about it and that, that, that economic aspect wasn't an issue, it was race. Mm -hmm. And they had an issue because they saw Black Lives Matter, meaning that white lives didn't matter. And to him, he told me straight to my face, he felt that Black Lives Matter was racist because he felt that they were saying that they were better. And you feel like that's a result of a lack of reporting lack of at that point? Yeah, I think lack of reporting. I mean, you know, Black Lives Matter didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't just suddenly come up. It had been on the surface bubbling up for a number of years. I mean, I'd say prior to 2012, you know, even though we may have not had a name for it, but it was it was happening. There was people that were pointing out injustices that were just not um, covered. And I would say that there, there was also a very simplistic um, reporting when it came to race. Uh, you know, you had all these people who would say, well, I don't think it could be race because some of these people voted for Obama. And if they voted for Obama, how could they, how could race mean anything? That means they can't be racist, right? <laughs> like, and that's without having any historical context of there are lots of people who've been very racist uh, who had a nice black friend or who had someone, you know, in their household who they loved was family and they were black, but they don't like those other type of black people. Um, and, and so I think that we have seen there, some of that has been, you know, definitely elevated where you've seen, you know, Ested Wesley at, at, at the New York Times and other people elevating some of the uh, the analysis that was happening around race um, that really wasn't based in the, the lived experiences of Black people. Um, this idea that, well, if you voted for Obama, well, you couldn't be concerned about race then, right? That means it's all done for you. That's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. I voted for Obama was the new I marched with Dr. King. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Jordan Peele so perfectly should have put that in the ground with that scene and get out with the, you know, I would have voted over for Obama. For like that just stops people from that line of thinking from the very start. But um, so, I mean, Johnny, you said something really interesting where you like named all these people who early on were, were waving this like, this is a problem, pay attention. Um, flag around the Trump administration and racial resentment among the administration and among voters, but also just sort of other um, anti-democratic tendencies that sort of existed within how the administration was functioning. And we had a question in, in the Q&A from um, Kim Glon about this question about how it's not the case that Black um, led organizations and historical Black media necessarily have these blinders on and the inability to cover um, this, this kind of context and content that you all are talking about. So I'm wondering what you each think Black political correspondents and commentators offer to election and policy coverage that might otherwise be missing. Is there a uniqueness or um, something valuable and important that, you know, um, the, the Black storytellers who are telling these stories, covering these issues and who are reporting are doing that their white colleagues or um, the institutions they work for maybe aren't doing and could be doing better. Are you asking me? Everybody. Okay. <laughs> I think it's the lived experiences. Um, you know, I I covered the, the election and I remember being with Mayor Pete Buttigieg uh, right before he was even having packed crowds. I think I had been in an event with him and he had maybe 12 people. Um, and I had traveled with him quite frequently um, at that point. And I was one of probably two or three reporters who were regularly with him at all times. And I, re I recall really starkly going to various cities that are predominantly African-American and looking in the lines and looking at these different crowds of people and they were all primarily white. We'd be in downtown Atlanta, mostly white, Chicago, mostly white. And 
I actually started writing about it quite early was the fact that, you know, maybe he's struggling with African American voters. And at that time, it was very early. Um, and people were like, well, you know, give him some time, maybe it'll get better. And as we traveled, it never got better. It was more, um, it would be more um, hesitancy. I mean, I would go to events and people would be excited to see me or wonder if I'm a protester. Um, and that was, I think, a lot of things that at least I talk, I, I took with my, my reporting. I mean, also a coronavirus, I covered coronavirus and just mostly any African-American uh, campaign reporter I was with um, that I knew, they knew someone who died of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, I personally had 20 people that I knew that died within a matter of months. And, you know, being able to tell the story about why African-Americans aren't able to stay in their houses. You know, maybe they live in an area that is a food desert or only has fast food options. So they have to take two buses to get to the local grocery store. I mean, being able to tell that lived experience, uh, I think really helped inform my reporting. And, you know, I, I, I was very blessed to have an outlet that said, you know what, this is your experience. There's somebody else that's probably having that experience in America, run with it. I think that it's it's absolutely, you know, what Beatrice is talking about is, you know, being able to, you know, have a different perspective because of things that you've been through or things that you know. And and now, and obviously to be clear, just because you're black doesn't mean you're an expert, you know, and now no one experience is is representative of all black people. But I think that there is a um there are certain things that you may know. And sometimes when you're in the room, I know I would ask a lot about black unemployment because every time we would get into a briefing, the first thing President Trump would say, or they would say is there's record low black unemployment. Well, black unemployment was still over 6%. Um, and, and so I would press on that issue because that would not be acceptable for any other group. Um, and even though you're taking this victory lap, um, there are a lot of people out there that are still hurting. And sometimes I would almost ask myself, well, should I ask this question? I'm the black woman asking the black question. But I also feel like, well, if I didn't do it, it might not get asked. And a lot of times it wouldn't get asked. And so my thing is, well, I if I'm in this position, then yeah, I'll ask the question. There are lots of other things that I, I work on and cover as well. But I, I'm going to ask the question because if I don't, it may not get asked. Mm -hmm. And and so, and I think it's important. And mm -hmm. it's important that we explore why is it okay that we have 6% Black unemployment? And that was back then. And that was the great thing. Uh, why is that okay? Mm -hmm. and, and what more needs to be done? Uh, and, and so that's what I think that Black reporters can bring or any, you know, who's re representing a group that is not, you know, the, the mainstream, you know, at these organizations, white people, that you can represent something um, and bring different perspectives. Yeah, I think there are two things. When, when I talk to my students about this, you know, because at Columbia, I would get this question um, that surprised me the first time I got it. And then I got it again and again and again. I've gotten that question probably 20 times at this point, but I would get you know, white students who would come to me and say, you know, should I cover stories relating to people of color or should I just leave that for, you know, black reporters to do or Latino reporters to do? And I was like, no, 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 no. Like we really need you to be able to cover these stories. And, you know, the comparison that I would give is that, you know, I grew up in Queens. I'm a Queens, native of Queens. If you have a story and if you, anybody who's ever driven in Queens knows you cannot drive in Queens. Like, it makes no sense. There's, there's not a grid. You know, there's 114th Street, 114th Road, 114th Place. It's just absurd. The only way that you get to navigate Queens is by continually going around and around and then eventually figuring out what exists in relationship to what. And if you have a story that you need that somebody to do that relates to Queens, send me. I don't need GPS. I don't need Google Maps. I have that all in here. I know where Linden Boulevard is. I know where Farmers Boulevard is. I know all those places. Um, and it's because I've spent hours and hours of my life dealing with that one particular environment. 
And so does it mean that only people from Queens can report on Queens? No, it means that those people have to put in the time and effort that it takes to understand what the difference between 114th place and 114th road. You understand what is you know, happening on one side of Liberty Avenue, what happens on the other side of Liberty Avenue, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of the class divides there and the kind of internal knowledge that you need to cover a place um, with nuance and detail. And so the same sort of thing goes with race, which is something that uh, by the nature of our lives in America, Black people have spent far, far more time thinking about and trying to understand than white people generally have. Uh, and like the reporter being sent out to Queens, it is very easy for you to get lost and go to the wrong place if you don't know what you're, what you're doing. And so I think that that's that. And I always want my students, um, my non-Black students to be the ones that are like, okay, I got this map, I have studied this map, I've driven around, I've gone all, I've spent all this time in Queens. So now the next time you ask me a, a question uh, about you know, uh, this particular neighborhood uh, and I need to write something about you know, this area, then I can actually do that. And I think that should be the objective, but it's always useful to have people who have a vantage point on these issues in house. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And I think that connects really well to, I'm gonna try to, loop a couple of questions and connect them to each other. Actually, one of my current students um, wanted me to ask you all about this question of um, like token representation. And this is a question that came up in our first panel of the day. So I'm gonna sort of try to connect it to that conversation. Um, she asks about the limits of representation in journalistic training, thinking about the idea that just because we have more black journalists covering the White House, that isn't necessarily enough, but often, you know, news organizations and journalism schools think simply putting people in the spots is enough. And we, you know, we heard stories from Maori and Aaron and Jean in our first panel today about how often um, folks within media organizations, black folks within media organizations are really faced with hostile work environments and be sent, are censored by their editors and aren't able to do what you all are talking about, which is like really tell these informed stories based on sort of their gut and experience um, connected to politics or other issues. So what else can be done? Like, what do you see as things that um, the industry itself can do uh, around um, telling stories uh, about politics and policy that do a good job connecting those issues um, to race and you know other issues that it's historically sort of fallen on the shoulders of, of black folks to tell. Well, I'm interested definitely to hear what everyone else has to say. I think first, um, certainly uh, I, I think we should not fall back on just, you know, tokenism, oh, we got someone in the slot, so now we're good. Um, but I think, you know, just to start off with, you could just start by hiring more, more Black people, more people of color, um, more people from diverse backgrounds. Um, it's just start there because a lot of uh, media companies have barely got to the token part. So they haven't, even got, you know, they don't even have the people yet. So let's just get some people in the door first. Um, and then once we get them in the door, let's keep them, let's try to train them and let's try to get them into higher levels of management. Um, we have more black people uh, from various backgrounds uh, in management, actually promote them, keep them within your organization um, and promote them to levels, higher levels of power. So I, I think that's first, but that in and of itself, just having representation is, is not enough because what really has to, for me, what I feel like has to happen is that it has to be a commitment uh, to cover race and not just cover race as this thing that we put on the side. This is my race beat and then everything else over here because as we know, race is a part of all of these issues. And so making a commitment means that you are covering race as a part of everything and that you're asking your business reporter, that you're asking your environmental reporter, that you're asking your retail reporter, that you're asking every reporter, how does race intersect with these issues? Because there are issues of race in all of that. There, there's not a beat where this is not important, where this is not a, your defense reporter, the State Department, all of those things, it's a part of it. And so it has to be a commitment and it also has to be a commitment within 
uh, not just to hire the, you're a black person. Okay. I hire you, but to hire experts, to hire people who, who do this work, there are people, there are sociologists, there are people who study this, there are people who can bring and lend an expertise and knowledge to organizations and you have to hire them, pay them for their expertise and give them um, authority to help shape coverage. Uh, and, and so that has to be something that is throughout the entire organization. It cannot be a project. It cannot be a young, one year thing that you do. We got diversity on the agenda this year. It has to be throughout the entire organization. And it also has to be something by which you judge your organization. Uh, executives get paid based on uh, how diverse their ranks are and how this coverage is done. You judge your organization on whether you do well at covering race throughout your entire organization. There have to be metrics by which people are judged and by which people can be promoted, get more money, something for this to be important. So that so those those are my sorry to get on my my little soapbox. But I just I've had some thoughts about this, but it, it, and it cannot just be the black journalist. It cannot just be the journalists of color. It cannot just be important to us. It has to be important um, to those people that are running these organizations. I think the part of this is about decision-making ability too. Um, you know, having people in, and to just echo Aisha, like being able to retain people, holding on to uh, the, the individuals you have. And also it, it, it's the same, I had this versions of this conversation in all of my lives in historical circles and general academic circles and media circles, you know, and just every, every kind of arena that I interface with, it's, you know, turning people into actual stakeholders so that they're not just there, you know, as window dressing. And an institution has to fundamentally, fundamentally be something different. You don't add diversity and then just continue to be what you were. Uh, so people are going to bring up new questions and new issues or new beats or new vantage points on beats that you already have or things that you haven't thought about, then if you're not going to actually empower those people to be able to make those changes or to pursue you know, those questions, then you really aren't diverse. You, know, you have just simply increased the number of people of color here at your organization, um, which will be a temporary state of affairs, by the way. Um, and you, it's, it's a kind of like, let's sprinkle some other people here like garnish uh, as opposed to actually transforming into institutions that will, by their very nature, do things differently than they did previously. And I think the word diversity inclusion is something very important because um, it's two parts, it's diversity and inclusion. And you can't have one without the other. And I think a lot of people kind of miss out on the idea that if you have a diverse team, are they being listened to across the board? Um, I'm actually very fortunate. We had frank discussions at, at ABC, at least on the campaign uh, season, during the campaign season with our fellow reporters. And um, I'm kind of well known for holding people accountable um, and telling my colleagues, especially my white colleagues, why aren't you doing stories of people of color? You know, why aren't you looking at this? Why aren't you looking at that? And, you know, I, I, I think a lot of, at least for me, a lot of my colleagues, not just at my network, but at other networks are, were receptive to listening to these things. But um, when it came to race, at least for, for me covering the election of last year, um, we had a lot of discussions and we had a lot of trainings. And I think that helped inform my reporting, but informed a lot of my colleagues who may have come from areas that were homogeneous, who may have not been in a community, grew up in a community that was, was African-American or diverse. And just by having those uh, entry points or those conversations with mm -hmm. experts um, and leaders about race really, I think, open the door for a lot of people. And I, I think, you know, you can have a team that is diverse, but if you're not listening to every voice, you're not getting anything out of it. And I think that's very important, but it's also the leadership too and the management. I was fortunate that I had leadership and management that was listening to what we were saying and, and reacting and changing to the situation. I mean, having a diversity and inclusion plan that worked in 2000, that worked in 2003, doesn't work now. You know, you have to 
update and you have to renovate and you have to do various things to make sure that you're updating with the culture. I mean, the, the word people of color, I mean, that's a new term. People were not using that term. And now people are having to understand and, I, and you can see it sometimes in some reporting where people use the word minority still. And it's like, we don't use that term anymore. I mean, it's, it's a diverse term, but you know, we use a lot of people use people of color. That's the more progressive term that people use. And I think just having that update and having that ability to change, to take the diversity and the inclusion, bring it together and update it, I think makes a big difference. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we of course are having like the same good challenge with this panel that we had with our first two, which is that we have so many good questions that as I'm trying to pull them out to ask you, I am actually throwing about three questions at you at once. So I appreciate how you each are carefully trying to answer parts of these questions. And I'm gonna do it to you again because you know we're running out of time. So 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 take the parts here that you want. Actually, both of these questions from come from colleagues of mine um, at, at at UPenn. Um, one, and, and we may have touched on this a little bit, is from Herman Beavers, and he is asking, he says, a number of news outlets, especially those owned by corporate conglomerates, have made declarations that they reject and stand against this systemic racism this year, right? We saw a lot of, not just news outlets, but organizations do that. He's wondering if you've seen in your movement around um, the political climate and covering politics and policy, an increase in representation of this exact thing you were talking about, Beatrice. Are there more Black folks in leadership positions in media organization? Is there more Black on-air talent? Um, are they putting their money where their mouth is or not? So that's the first question. Take it if you want it. The second question is from my colleague Monroe Price. Um, he apologizes for how on the nose it is, but wants to know um, about the intersection of race and the electoral recounts right now. How are the events, for example, in Georgia, um, dramatic case studies of how race journalism and policies um, fundamental, are fundamental to democracy and, and what could be doing, being doing better or is doing, being done well in covering those, those uh, particular recount cases? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I'll take the first one at least <laughs> at the beginning, um, at the offset. But um, I do think a lot of outlets had to think about race and and having social media be such an open outlet, I think really has changed the way that people have to address race. Um, you had a number of outlets who presented teams that cover politics that were not diverse. And because of it, they were slammed on social media. They were slammed by people of the public. They were slammed by politicians. They were slammed by public figures. Um, and they had to adjust. And I think a lot of outlets, you know, it's, it's, it's unacceptable at this point. It's 2020. It's unacceptable to have a team that is not diverse. It does not look like America. And does that mean you have like a team of Avengers or you have a, a group of people who just check a box? No, they have to have power. They have to have rain. And I think a lot of places have had to have a come to Jesus moment, especially in Washington, about that. Um, you know, it, it's not just okay to have a whole bunch of uh, reporters of color if their editors are not of color or are not understanding diverse communities. Because one word that may be okay to you um, may not be okay to a whole community of people. And I think a lot of places have had to have that, that awakening and not just in journalism, but I think also in politics as well. You, it's no longer acceptable to have um, a, a campaign that reflects mostly white men. That's not okay anymore. Um, you know, President-elect Biden's uh, rollout of his campaign uh, the campaign is really looking at, you know, their names of cabinet members. And the reason they're doing that is because they don't want to get slammed. They don't want the idea that they're only picking from white America when America is so diverse and so many diverse people put in. Um, so I, I, I do think that, you know, just the, I think social media really changed a lot of things because you cannot no longer just exist in a corner. Now your corner is a part of America. Yeah, I'll just say really quickly, you know, I think the, the Biden, incoming Biden administration is dealing with the uh, fallout of the fact that they can't get Susan Rice in as Secretary of State, you know, because they don't have the Senate. If they gained control of the Senate, then that would have been their big kind of diversity point, first black Secretary of State. Well, actually not first black, but you know, they would have a black Secretary of State and that's not going to happen. Um, 
And I think that, you know, to the question, first off, also, you know, shout out to Herman Beavers, uh, you know, he's a good brother. I haven't seen you in a good minute, but uh, I also wanted to say uh, that as it pertained to people saying Black Lives Matter, if you remember there was that month where every place, Amazon, Apple, like all Netflix, you know, they all had, you know, Black Lives Matter on their home pages. And I remember saying that, you know, for a lot of companies, it would be an improvement just for them to start with live matter, lives matter, you know, it's like, like we, we're not impressed with the way that you treat white people who work for you. Um, and so there's that. Uh, but I, I also think I'm reminded of something that Mark Morial said to me when we were in Charleston, you know, after uh, the shooting there at Emmanuel and, you know, after they took down the, the Confederate flag, uh, I dismissed it as empty symbolism. And, you know, Mark and I were walking along Meeting Street, you know, where the church is. And he said, yeah, but, you know, symbolic victories are what keep you going until you get to the substantial ones. And so I was thinking the fact that people had to concede and say that Black Lives Matter, the fact that public sentiment had gone so far uh, as to say that this is now not only a thing that people have done, but that people are being criticized if they don't do it. Uh, that's a beginning point that you begin to say, okay, it is possible to push people in this direction. Uh, and I know, of, you know, a bunch of places that are now throwing money at diversity and inclusion, you know, whether or not that translates into anything, you know, what is yet to, to be seen. Um, but I, I think that the, the symbolic victory of that should not be uh, underestimated. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to tackle the question of like the intersection of, of race and the recount news, the demands for the recounts? I think there's a lot going on there, especially because of the cities of Philadelphia, Detroit, Milwaukee, Milwaukee right. right? I mean, there's, that's a- that's I will say, can I say very quickly, if you watch my, my documentary, Whose Votes Count on PBS Frontline, you know, we deal, we tackle this. I don't want to like self-promote, but I mean, I did happen to do a documentary on this very exact thing. So- uh, in, in kind of recognition of time, you can yeah. Just Will you drop a link in the in the in the chat? Sure. Yeah. Well, I do, I do think a lot of people are having to you know, frankly, talk about race. I mean, these are cities that are majority black and brown, um, and I think for some people they just look at the cities and they say, oh, they're just inner, inner cities, but they don't realize what voting means to Black Americans. You know. For us, I mean, I'm one generation from the Voting Rights Act. Um, you know, I my mom voted in every election that came up, and a lot of my friends' uh, parents and 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 friends do the same thing. And I think a lot of people don't understand, you know, quite what that means for the targeting of these cities because they see these pictures and these images of people waiting in long lines to vote vote in elections, which is insane in itself in this country, but um, they see these lines and they say, okay, well, that's just a narrative. These people waited in line, they voted record turnout. No, it's, it's not that. I mean, you go to certain other cities that have record turnout and they don't have these lines. They don't have the voter disenfranchisement. Um, I think a lot of people had to adjust to, to the idea of these are cities that were specifically targeted because they're black and brown, because their communities of color. And I, I, I think now people are adjusting to, to that. I don't think that that was the media narrative straight, straight early on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we are actually up against our, our time here. And, and for the sake of people, um, um, we're going to try to stick to it. We have some great other questions that we didn't get to. Um, if you, uh, if the panelists want to actually like type answers, they can, no pressure. Um, but I want to thank you all so much um, for being here. And I want to ask one more, this is like the hot seat uh, question. What policy issue or political issue do you think journalists really need to be focusing on in the next six months to a year? It's just one? <laughs> I know it's hard. Um, well, I mean, I will say that here's one thing, you know, the, the Obama administration was congenitally moderate and was kind of walking on 
eggshells because it never wanted to be seen as unduly favor, showing undue favoritism toward black people. But the real thing that I think is gonna be uh, around the question of the disparate impacts of the pandemic, the disparate impacts of the pandemic recession, uh, the disparate impacts of these particular questions and whether or not the Biden administration will have the temerity to approach those questions, those issues with policies that target the communities that were hardest hit by those issues. I think we'll still be looking at the the, the pandemic, um, you know, the the uneven impact of the pandemic. I, you know, what I will be interested in um, looking at is how, you know, the economic policy. There has been some talk over the past year of maybe changing the focus of the way economic policy. This idea, obviously, that you know all boats will rise together, and looking at well, how do that if you help those um, like black women, black people, that that actually will benefit the entire community if you make sure that they are not being left behind, and does that end up translating into different policies? Uh, and, and so I am interested in how this administration will look at that. It's kind of, it's, you know, we'll look at that um, and whether they will make more bold policies when it comes to those, that economic fallout. Um, and, and, but, and so that's one of the things that I'll be looking at. I think healthcare for me, at least healthcare and access to healthcare. Um, I, I, we're, we're talking about the vaccine and, you know, there's a lot of positive news coming out, but I will tell you this every six hours, I hear from someone, an old source, someone I went to school with, someone in my community, um, who are saying that they will not take the vaccine mm -hmm. one way or another, they will not take it. And a lot of the issues is to reasons why they won't take it. And these are, uh, black Americans, white Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, it's, it's, rooted in distrust to the system, distrust to the healthcare process. And I think that's something that a lot of people um, maybe need to look into because, you know, yes, we have a vaccine, but is it gonna get to communities? How do you educate these communities? I mean, you may have a celebrity that takes a vaccine, but they have access to medicine. What happens to the man down the street who doesn't have access to healthcare, doesn't have a regular physician to go to, doesn't know how to take a COVID test, hasn't taken a COVID test before. Um, and I think that's a lot of the conversations I think that needs to be had is to, is, is healthcare. Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been Wonderful. I appreciate you all taking the time out of your day. I am going to wish you farewell and introduce the next panel. Um, but please, everyone, follow these three fabulous folks. They're all on Twitter. They're probably all in other places, too, in addition to the places where they write, report, uh, broadcast, etc. cetera. Um, easy, to, easy to find with a, a Google. And um, we'll move right along. Thank you so much, all. Take care.